We've been waiting impatiently, and Netflix dragged their feet, as they always do, but finally, Bridgerton Season 3 has a release date, and there's some new promotional images, so let's discuss. Hi, I'm Lady Genevieve, and on my channel, I like to talk about entertainment media. Happy New Year, happy 2024. I hope all of your New Years are full of wonderful things. Now, I've talked about Bridgerton multiple times on my channel. If I were to give you one video to recommend, it would be my Benedict Bridgerton video essay. It's about an hour and a half long because I was very thorough because he's my favorite. I know the more fun thing to talk about is the promotional images, but I do want to talk about the release dates first. We have two of them. May 16th and June 13th, four episodes per release date. This is a rather significant change and an important one at that. Netflix has always dumped their seasons out in one go up until this point. That's been the standard for years. A lot of Korean dramas do a weekly release, but I don't know all of what goes into that decision. And to be quite frank, I would rather there be a pause on new Korean dramas until Netflix starts paying Koreans residuals. I don't care how entertaining a show is, I don't think any show is more important than the workers getting paid their fair share of the profits their labor generated in the first place. Netflix is nearing the end of a lot of its bigger series. Bridgerton is one of the few that has a clear path for potentially many more seasons left to do. You had A through H built into the fabric of the source material, and so far we've only done D, A, and C is up next. That leaves a fair few letters of the alphabet still to go, and you could do a few other spin-offs here and there if you feel like it. I, for one, am hungry for an Edwina Friedrich miniseries, but that's a conversation for another day if you're interested in having that. The season dropping model is bad. It's bad for workers. That's been made abundantly clear with all the conversations and interviews that were coming out during the dual strikes. If you drop everything in one go and put aside your hedonistic desire to inhale the entire thing as a fan, as a general tendency, this model tends to push shows towards becoming a flash in the pan instead of an ongoing event and a fixture of pop culture. And for most of the series that don't have the level of name power as Bridgerton, the cast and crew of those shows are left trapped in these horrific corporate limbo states where this company will not give them a timely answer about whether or not the show is going to continue, whether or not they need to get to work on creating the next season, and more importantly, whether or not they need to look for other jobs. So yes, I feel strongly that Bridgerton being one of the biggest shows Netflix has right now, and it making the switch to a double release date is a step in the right direction. Ultimately, my ideal evolution for this would be that I would like for Bridgerton and all Netflix series to either switch to the old school cable model or the prime video model. The old school cable model would be one new episode per week that would keep Bridgerton in the ongoing pop culture discourse both on and offline for at least a complete two months if not longer. It would also give the shows that aren't already as massive as Bridgerton more time to hopefully find the right audience that will suit whatever that show's concept is. The prime video model would be that on the premiere date you release three episodes and then each week after that it would be one new episode until you've released your entire season. The benefit of something like that would be that you give the audience a large your sample size of your story to hopefully get invested in so that they will keep coming back to watch new episodes. Maybe the best case scenario would ultimately be that the creative team of the series would be able to choose which of those models they would prefer to use, the old school cable model or the prime video model. Presumably, the people who have spent months, if not longer, working on the story will have more of an idea of what they think is the best way to unveil the story to attract its intended audience. Also, on a more personal note, I love the idea of Benedict's season doing one new episode per week because I want my guy to be the main character for as long as possible. And I would like for everyone to be talking about him for as long as possible. You work as a model as a way of learning from the lectures. Ingenious. Now let's get into the promotional images. I wanted to go back and talk about all of the promotional images since some of these have been around for months, but I hadn't really addressed them on my channel. The first batch of photos, I believe, was first revealed back during Tadum. I still hate that name, by the way. I don't think you're ever going to win me over on that. Instead of nitpicking every detail of each photo individually, since these particular images have been out for a while, I will just share a few points of feedback that I think span multiple of this set. The first noticeable thing I would call 
attention to is that Penelope is no longer wearing yellow. The costuming has always focused on the Featheringtons wearing citrus colors. Penelope in particular is often forced to wear yellow. And to be clear, I don't think her costuming is ugly, but they make a point of communicating that Penelope doesn't like wearing yellow. And it's that lack of choice for me that makes yellow have this negative connotation for her as a character. Well, at least you do not see fit to dress you as a sunflower. I declare a bee might mistake me for the real thing. <laughs> uh, Miss Bridgerton. Beautiful dress. Oh, thank you. I quite like yours as well. You have a sense of humor. No, I did not mean, I am being truthful. It is quite beautiful indeed. But I seem to have grown weary of the color. <laughs> The Bridgertons tend to lean more towards pastels and also more specifically the color blue. If we look at this first batch, we see Penelope's wardrobe more so matching the type of outfits the Bridgerton family might be seen wearing, which is a visual cue of her moving more towards the end game of her marrying Colin and becoming a Bridgerton because patriarchal name change customs. We also see Penelope having her hair down. Now I've talked before about male Bridgerton characters being less buttoned up as a signal of sorts that we're going to learn something deeper about them. Maybe the buttons up top are undone or their forearms are exposed. But for Penelope as a female character, a version of that would be getting to see her hair undone. We don't usually see her with her hair like that. Most of the time her hair is up and it's styled. Maybe you see her a little less done up when she's alone writing a Lady Whistledown newsletter, but that's still been a very rare occurrence. We've got her hair down and she's looking pensive at her window because she's the main character this time. She's going to have a a lot more mess going on, the ups and downs of a period romance. And the final point I noted in this first batch is that the heat is turning up. One of the photos of Colin and Penelope is more so reminiscent of the type of chemistry we're used to seeing between them. This is them, presumably at a ball, because these are all upper class characters who don't work, they just go to balls and gossip. This is that Colin the clown, you're my friend, you do not count chemistry we've already been used to seeing. But this photo, this one is new. This is called, we haven't smashed yet, but we are well on our way chemistry. This is the main couple of the season chemistry. This is period piece foreplay chemistry. Okay, now let's jump to the newer batch of photos. You already know which one I'm going to talk about last, so don't ask me when I'm talking about it. I'm saving it for the end. The first image I'm going to address is this one. Francesca's in the middle, Mama Violet is on the left, and Hyacinth is on the right. Francesca used to be played by a different actress who left to be the main character on a different Netflix show that got released all at once and was canceled after just one season. You see why I went on a whole long explanation of why we need to switch to weekly episodic airing to help some of the other shows out? That's why. Not every Netflix show is Bridgerton and these workers are out here being scammed. Death, death to the enemies of the people of the Republic. <laughs> This Francesca looks significantly older than the last Francesca. Maybe they're the same age, I have no idea, but the other one looked like a baby teenager and this one looks like a grown woman. That makes me think that maybe we've got a bit of a time jump. Quick reminder, since I didn't say this at the beginning of this video, I have not read the books. I don't read them until after I've watched a season adaptation. I don't want spoilers. You can talk about spoilers on somebody's booktube channel. I've only read books one and two. Anyway, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but the deliberate choice to release a promotional image where Francesca is in the center makes me think she will actually have material, whereas in the other seasons, she's barely even been there. Obviously, it's not her season yet, so I personally don't need to see too much of her yet because I do not want a repeat of season two where the Featherington family mine subplot ate up all that screen time and for what? We've got the main couple of season three, we've got married Cantony, we've got my favorite Bridgerton, Benedict, who had better get some warm up to his season because if he's not season four, we will have a fight. <laughs> And I'm assuming the Featherington family will have a fair bit of screen time simply because of their proximity to Penelope. And they'll of course insist on showing me monarchy content, which I certainly don't want any more of because that's what England needs more of? Monarchy? I don't think so. We're in the home of the enemy, Kathleen! Michael! The Italian cheers, Just Kathleen, enjoy your- Even the Italians got rid of their monarchs, but you still have yours? Clownery! What were we talking about? The Bridgerton characters. It's a large ensemble. And if you're not going to extend the episode count, try to be mindful of the balance of screen time and who gets what portion of that. Oh! 
Benedict dear. I will definitely be there instead of having sex with someone. The people who make this show have really been playing with Benedict from the start. So if I get more Francesca screen time than I do get Benedict, it will be time for fisticuffs. This photo of Penelope and Eloise, I'm going to assume this is them having the conversation they've needed to have. Work on your issues. You had a big fight. So it's time to talk things out, reconcile. You're going to be sisters-in-law soon. Let's not have this carrying over and making the wedding awkward. Another thing I noticed in this picture, Penelope's still in yellow, but the rest of the promo we've seen her in, not in yellow. This feels very episode one. If there's a time jump, this is pre-time jump. If I compare this photo to this other one where it's her and Colin, another thing I noticed besides the color of her dresses, it's the way the dress fits her. One of the things I noticed in reading the first two Bridgerton books is how obnoxiously written they are about communicating the fact that Penelope is supposed to be plus size. Despite my best efforts to avoid Spoilers, I have heard rumblings that Penelope in the books does a weight loss makeover. Thankfully, I don't think they've had Nicola do any sort of weight drop. But speaking purely on speculation, I would think that they've been deliberately styling her as Penelope in such a way that they sew or tailor her dresses to be slightly less flattering on her body than the way they're potentially presumably styling her for the bulk of her own season where she's the main character. If you compare back and forth between these two new images of her, the fabric of the bluish dress falls differently on her than the fabric of the yellow dress. Now I am by no means any sort of expert on sewing or tailoring, so I'm not really somebody that can get ultra specific in explaining those sewing or tailoring techniques. But if I'm correct in my visual assessment of the differences between these two dresses, I actually really like the idea that the difference isn't even really about her body. It's just about visually presenting how much happier and more confident you are when you get to dress the way you want to dress. As a general tendency, I feel like you're happier when you get to express yourself the way that you want. And that includes how you dress yourself. And also, no matter what type of body you have, there's probably certain clothing that you feel is more or less flattering to wear. That's not a principle I'm saying about weight specifically. The world is full of different bodies, different features, different proportions, and also different preferences about how one chooses to style oneself. There's really no good, let alone ethical reason to force Nicola to do a drastic weight drop. You can just style her accordingly relative to where Penelope happens to be on her character journey. And that's why you need to pay costume designers and tailors, all of those people, more money. Let them do their work at a high standard. One other detail before we move on for this image. What is going on with your hand, Colin? Did you punch someone? Because I'm all for a bit of righteous violence. <laughs> Who are we fighting? If that's already known to book readers, don't tell me because I want to be surprised. I want to have no idea who he's hitting unless it ends up being in the trailer. Next up, widow baby Colin is angry. Why are we angry? Why are we frowning? Okay, but really, you know what I'm seeing here? Undone buttons. This always happens on Bridgerton. It's a period piece and everyone's all buttoned up and tightly wound. Once you want to start peeling back the layers of characters, that also tends to involve undoing some buttons, rolling up some sleeves, letting one's hair down. See, if Colin had his sleeves rolled up and his forearms were out, I would know we were really in for it, but this is a good start. Why are we mad, Colin? Did we realize maybe we have feelings for our lifelong bestie, but we weren't very bright and told her that she doesn't count? I hope you're feeling awfully foolish and entirely embarrassed because this man has been on some clownery behavior for a while now. And uh, she has bigger mangles than you. Next photo I want to talk about, it's this ensemble. You see how Hyacinth is holding that ridiculous feather thing that Eloise was wearing when she had to make her debut in front of the monarch? Well, maybe they're looking at Francesca because we did D in season one, E in season two. So that would mean it's F's turn. I'm sort of intrigued by the expression Violet Gregory and Hyacinth have. Antony has a little bit of tension as well in his face, but less so than the other three I just mentioned. See how he just needed to find the love of his life and now he's far less wound up? That married life really does a Bridgerton good. But you know what else I see? Kate is standing next to Benedict. This is not a drill. I want them to be friends. I have said this before. I always felt that Benedict liked Kate's vibe, but not in a weird way, just in a I'm confident and secure in my masculinity, despite the fact that I live in an extremely sexist time period, to such an extent that I actually really like strong, opinionated, rule-breaking women. Mm -hmm. Are we all set for the hunt, brother? Indeed we are. Kate, tell him I used to shoot all the time. Miss Edwina. <laughs> Oh, 
Ladies do not hunt. Back whoa, whoa, the whoa, whoa, whoa. fuck up. Okay. Get whoa. away from me, all of you. But Kate doesn't look stressed either. See how much easier life is when you're not having to fight for your very survival to maintain economic security just to exist? Must be nice. Anyway, Benedict is doing the face that he always does. While everyone else is stressing, he's just vibing because he's what? A capybara. The other reason why I'm thinking we have a time jump, look at how different Eloise looks. Compare the difference in this playful, youthful hairstyle, the likes of which we're used to seeing from her up until this point, but now she's in this almost matronly garb with the updo. Yeah. Okay, now let's finally talk about the main event. Married Kate and Anthony. My parents? Kate is mothering? while Anthony is serving daddy. Daddy? I know that these are merely Cantony crumbs, but I will take them. I really will. First off, I cannot emphasize enough how much I love Kate's costuming here. She wore a variation of colors in season two, but I think it's safe to say that her staple colors were vibrant purple and vibrant orange. So we've got her wearing one of her signature colors, but there's also these accents of blue on the dress and in her hair, which I love so much. If we compare the shifts in color journeys for Penelope and Kate, they mean very different things on a storytelling level. Penelope shifting her coloring from yellow to these blue tints means something very different. Penelope is oppressed by her family, her mother in particular. Her own autonomy and emotional well being is not a priority for Portia Featherington. Penelope, presumably, would see joining the Bridgerton family and becoming a Bridgerton as a form of freedom and also self-actualization. She's living her best life because she gets to fall in love with someone and be loved in return. But with Kate, her colors are not only an expression of her as an individual person, but I definitely get the impression that the color design is intertwined with communicating her heritage. Season two made a point of bringing in these cultural references, Indian tea, Indian pre-wedding customs, the bangles, and so on and so forth. I think it's more important to maintain that color story for Kate because it's been a priority for the storytelling to really maintain that cultural identity and keep it present. And really, I don't think it would go over very well to have an Indian woman marry an English man and lose any sort of indication of her ethnic and cultural background. I just said in my top 10 of 2023 video that I don't recommend ever assimilating with colonizers. And even if Bridgerton exists in an alternate dimension where maybe England never committed centuries of war crimes against India, England is still a colonial evil in the Bridgerton universe. The Featherington family subplot of season two that none of us asked for mentioned the possibility of them, what was it, running away to the colonies? The, the mines were in the colonies, meaning America, and Queen Charlotte, the monarchy propaganda show, also made a point of having that queen complaining about how those pesky colonies weren't paying enough taxes for these royals to maintain a disgustingly excessive parasitic existence. So, death to all of them. Putting my perpetual rage aside against colonial states that are still up and running today. For as long as Kate is appearing on Bridgerton, I want it to always be clear that she's an Indian woman and that needs to be expressed. I know that was a very long tangent just because of her dress, but my patience is wearing especially thin against colonizers right now more than usual, if that's even possible. France is trying to reclaim their colonial occupation of Burkina Faso because they dared to liberate themselves. They keep trying to do more coups. And to say I'm angry would be putting it mildly. I want to live in a world where the biggest problem I have is worrying about whether or not Kate and Anthony will have enough screen time in the new season of Bridgerton. Wouldn't that be nice? What if that was the biggest problem I had to deal with? I want to be able to luxuriate in how a single promotional image of Kate and Anthony has set off large packs of people online who are hungry for romance. The people want passion and they want it now. Why do you think I fought so hard for anyone but you here on my channel for months before it was released? I want my rom-coms. I want my cute, fun romances. I can't quite decide what I want for Cantony in season three because part of me wants them to just get to hang out and be hot while everyone else is in crisis mode. But part of me also loves the idea of them unpacking some of their baggage. Maybe we could finally talk about Kate's mother, you know? I would imagine that either way, whatever their approach is, I will enjoy their performances because their chemistry is so ridiculous that even a single promotional image has people talking nonstop. 
But being that this is the season of Colin and Penelope's love story, I'm intrigued to see whatever it is that they're going to do for them. And no matter the execution, I am more than happy for Nicola Coughlin to have more of a spotlight on her. She's a great actress. She's very funny when she's given comedy to do. And she has been an unwavering ally in advocating for oppressed people who are in desperate need of support, which reminds me that I will have links in my description box moving forward if you would like to donate to the Middle Eastern Children's Alliance, the Palestine Children's Relief Fund, the Animal Friends Shelter, which is a Palestinian animal shelter, as well as eSIMS for Gaza. I always have global health partners listed in there as well, which is a medical nonprofit for Latin American countries, but I wanted to expand the list of resources that I have in my video descriptions. Thank you all for watching. Thank you to my patrons and subscribe if you would like to follow along with more Bridgerton videos moving forward. I don't know all of what I will be making and when, but definitely if something new drops, perhaps a trailer, I will do my best to make a new video about that as soon as I'm able to do so. Bye.